Hey guys, it's Hannah, and today I'm coming to you with my book review for Empire of Storms by Sarah J Maas. This is the fifth book in the Throne of Glass series, so for the most part this video is going to be completely spoiler filled. I really can't talk too much about this book without giving away spoilers because it is the fifth book in a series. But if you have read all the other books so far and you want to know my thoughts on Queen of Shadows, the fourth book in the series, I already have a discussion video for that one, so I will leave it linked on the screen as well as down below so you can go check that out. But as for a quick spoiler free overview of my thoughts on this one. I did not enjoy this book very much. It is my lowest rated Throne of Glass book so far. I had a lot of issues with the character development. I had a lot of issues with the plot, with the writing, with just everything overall. The series is just headed in a completely different direction than the first two books were, and I'm all for change in a series. I understand the writer grows, the characters grow, the plot develops, but in this case it's kind of undoing the previous books in the series, and I think that it's become somewhat problematic in that sense. But I have already written a complete non-spoiler review of this on Goodreads, so I will leave that link down below if you want to hear more of my non-spoilery thoughts. If you're still hesitant about picking this one up and you just want to hear my general thoughts on it with no spoilers, see my star rating and everything, you can definitely go check that one out. But as for the remainder of this video, I'm now going to get into my discussion on this, complete with spoilers. So if you have not read this book and you don't want to be spoiled for anything that happens in Empire of Storms, I highly suggest you click away now because I'm about to start spoiling the entirety of this book. <laughs> if you do end up reading this book, definitely come back and we can discuss all of your thoughts on Empire of Storms together, but for now, if you have not read it and you do not want to be spoiled, click away. Alright, so for all of you spoilery people, let's just get started. <laughs> so just as a little preface for this, I overall didn't have high expectations for this book, because if you've seen my Queen of Shadows book talk, then you know that I didn't really enjoy that one. I had a lot of problems with the characters, I had a lot of problems with not the plot so much, just because it was kind of lacking in that one at least, but I just overall felt like the series was changing too much, so I didn't really expect too much out of Empire Storms. I was just kind of excited to be back in the world and see if maybe it would improve upon the last book. So I can't really say that I was disappointed in this once I finished it, but honestly I didn't expect to dislike it as much as I did. So my biggest problems with Queen of Shadows were the direction that Aelin's character was headed in. I felt like she was trying to erase her past as Selena, and I can understand why a character would want to do that, but to just completely and utterly ignore that part of her life that took up so much of her life seemed more like character regression to me, even though it was trying to be presented as character development, and I just didn't see that. And in this book I feel like it was just exaggerated to a whole nother level. I honestly can't stand Aelin's character. She's so snarky and sassy to the point where it honestly doesn't feel like she's a character anymore. She feels like a caricature and she's just this exaggerated version of like that snarky sassy character. And it's just made her so irritating to me that I just... I can't stand her anymore. And my other biggest problem with Aelin was something that I also noticed in Queen of Shadows, and it's the way that she lies to the reader and to the other characters in the book. And what I mean by that is that Sarah J Maas will write in these little sections where Aelin is like contemplating something or she's thinking about something, but it's just like really vague. And then like 10, 20 chapters later, it's revealed that she had some giant plot or scheme planned out this entire time and she didn't tell anybody about it. And all of a sudden, and all of these things happen and then you realize that Aelin had planned all of this from the very beginning, like at the very end of the book when you find out about the whole plan that she'd made with Lysandra. But it's just things like that that are just revealed throughout the rest of the plot and I feel like they're supposed to be shocking or surprising and they're just done for like dramatic effect, but honestly I don't find them dramatic or interesting, they just infuriate me. It just makes Aelin such an untrustworthy character and there's something to be said for an unreliable narrator and things like that in certain books, but it's in this case it doesn't make sense because we're supposed to be on Aelin's side, but throughout the entire book we're reading and I'm constantly like, I know she's planning something, I know she's going to be doing something, I know she's lying to us right here, so I can't believe anything she's saying to me right now because I know that there's something else behind closed doors. And I understand how that's probably more of a personal thing for me, I just don't like reading a story like that where the main protagonist, who is supposed to be someone that I'm supposed to like or relate to or trust in some sort of way at least, is someone that I can't stand because she's constantly lying to me and to everyone else in the book. So I get that that's again more of 
probably a personal critique that I have for this, but it's just something that bothers me to no end and I can't get over it with these books. Oh, and just a quote that I found really, really funny. It was on page 55 when they're having that whole meeting with Daro. Um, she says something along the lines of like, I know you may find some of my tactics to be problematic or something like that. And then Daro responds to her by saying, I find everything about you, princess, to be problematic. I read that and I was on the floor cracking up because honestly, that's how I feel about her too. So moving right along onto Rowan, whom I also can't stand. <laughs> I said this in my Queen of Shadows book talk as well, and I know Rowan is just like a really well-loved character, and so is Aelin. She's so many people's favorite character. But wow, I just can't tolerate either of them. And we'll get into their relationship in a little bit as well, but like Rowan individually, oh. <laughs> Honestly, I could just talk about all of the male characters lumped into one because every single one of them is exactly the same character with different color hair and eyes. That's pretty much it. All of the male characters in this series are just tan, princely men who walk around and are overly territorial about their girlfriends and can't stand them talking to any other male character because they get too jealous. And I am so over it. I've never liked the overly territorial male character trope just to begin with, but in this book, Oh my god, it, I think it's become probably my least favorite trope of all time. It's not romantic, it's just infuriating. <laughs> and Sarah J Maas uses the excuse that because they're fey men, it's just something that's like inborn into them. And that's just ridiculous. Why would you further perpetuate this harmful norm of masculinity that men have to be protective over their female love interests? Like, why? Like, what purpose does that serve? A perfect example in this book is after Aelin and Rowan have sex, which I will get into that later because I have a lot to say on that scene as well, but they literally have sex three times and then they walk into this room and Adian is just sitting in a chair and Rowan says the line, and I quote, Rowan bit down against the rage at the sight of the other males near his queen, reminding himself that they were his friends. He literally couldn't stand the fact that Aiden was just sitting in this chair in his room and Aelin came up to him and started talking to him. That was too much for him to handle and he had to bite down against the rage. Like, are you kidding me? Like, dude, you just had sex with her three times on the beach. Why are you so jealous of her talking to her cousin? Like, I don't understand. Are we really supposed to interpret that as being completely romantic or him being so in love with her or something? Like, because that's, that's just not, that it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. And again, like I mentioned before, the excuse they constantly use is just saying that it's a overly territorial fey male thing. And like, why? Why would you, why would you do that? Again, what purpose does it serve other than making every single one of your male characters completely and utterly insufferable? Almost every relationship in this book is exactly the same because all of the male characters do this exact same thing with their female love interests. And speaking of, every single relationship in this book is a white heterosexual one. We get this little blurb about like Aelin's uncle having some gay lover and then we get that like one line that Adian says about himself being bisexual which great there's representation of that but there is literally no non-straight white relationship in this entire series and she has so many characters and so many relationships that she could have at least done it once you know we could have seen one gay relationship in this one non-straight relationship in this but we never do <laughs> and the other thing is that not only is every relationship in here white and heterosexual everyone has to be in a relationship like no character in this series is ever single only in air of fire did we ever see aelin without a love interest and i'm not saying it's a bad thing that she's had multiple love interests i'm just saying that nobody in this series can ever be single like everyone has to be in a relationship all the time like they can never just be by themselves and live their own independent lives yeah sure everyone at the end of this book pretty much breaks up or is separated or whatever but like you know they're gonna get together like there's no way that these characters are gonna end up single because god forbid if you put a bunch of attractive royals together in one room they have to end up with each other there's no way they could stay single that's just that's unrealistic also on that same note of course everyone in this series has to be like drop-dead gorgeous model status and i just 
Honestly, why? Just why? But nonetheless, back to Rowan's character in general, aside from the fact that he's constantly having to bite down against the rage of Aelin talking to other men, um, he's just completely boring. And again, I said this in my Queen of Shadows book talk, but Rowan only serves the purpose to be Aelin's love interest and like right hand man. He just gives up anything for her and does whatever for her and he's just there to be her love interest and it's so so infuriating. I've said this before as well but it's exactly the same as when you have a female character who's just introduced to be the love interest of a male character. Rowan essentially serves the same purpose and it's not interesting either way. Now on to Aelin and Rowan's relationship just as a whole. Um, that was probably one of my biggest problems with this book in general, aside from Aelin and Rowan's characters individually, because I don't like them individually, but then you put them together and oh my god, it's just a new level of just, I can't stand it. <laughs> it mostly stems from the fact that I don't like each of them as individual characters, and then the other part is that I hate the whole stupid territorial fae male thing. But apart from that, what this book did that made me like them even less, if that was possible, was that it added in a whole fate dynamic. At the end, when we find out that Aelin and Rowan have always been fated to be each other's mates, I just, I couldn't stop rolling my eyes. The way I see it, when you add in a fate aspect to a relationship, it kind of negates everything that the characters already went through. If the two are fated to be with one another, then all of these things that they've said to each other, all of the things that they've gone through, is honestly irrelevant because they would have ended up together or been together in some sort of way at one point or another, no matter what they'd gone through. So did any of it really mean anything? And that's where I really have a problem with that because it just undoes everything that we already went through with the rest of the story. So what was the point of all of this anyway? And then I feel like we were supposed to be shocked or something when we found out that Aelin knew this whole time that she and Rowan were mates, but she didn't tell Rowan. And then Rowan is like devastated that he didn't know because she didn't tell him. And like, I don't understand, was that supposed to be shocking? Because I feel like we knew that like three books ago. It was obvious that they were like gonna end up together. I don't know, I just wasn't shocked by this. I don't know if that's just me because I read into it differently or something, but it just wasn't surprising to me. I was just like, yeah, of course you're supposed to be together. That's what this entire series is about. Moving on to Aelin and Rowan's more romantic scenes. Um, yeah, that was just literal smut. <laughs> I didn't have a problem with there being like sex in this book or like the characters having sex. I mean, it's, I don't think it's weird and I don't think it shouldn't be in a young adult book. I was just caught off guard because like, those were descriptive sex scenes, like new adult level sex scenes. And it felt like I was reading a fan fiction, honestly. And it was just kind of surprising to me. Like I really didn't expect that. And then of course we get into the descriptions of the sex scenes where she described Rowan's penis as velvet wrapped steel. So uh, that was a thing that happened. <laughs> but anyway, moving on to some of the other characters. Um, we had Alid and Lorcan, which I honestly don't have that much to say about because I found a lead in this book especially to be a lot more boring. Um, I really liked her in Queen of Shadows. I thought she was really interesting and I thought her character was headed in a cool direction. But in this one, she really didn't do much. She just traveled with Lorcan. Um, they became a thing. I didn't care by the end of it, so. And Lorcan, again, just an overly territorial fey male who's also super attractive. And once again, I didn't care. <laughs> and then we have Adian and Lysandra, which I can, I'm just repeating myself in here, but like, same thing, same relationship over and over again. I did, like I said earlier, like the little bit where we got to hear that Adian is actually canonically bisexual, which was like, nice, but we've still never seen any sort of non-straight relationship in this book. And then Lysandra, I love Lysandra, I think she's a great character. I just think that she's too loyal to Aelin because I can't stand Aelin, so I don't want her to be loyal to Aelin, but that's just me being petty. But overall, I think Lysandra is one of the more interesting characters in the series overall, and one of the only ones that I still kind of like and have some positive feelings towards. I did really like the part where she turned into the giant sea dragon. That was cool. Um, and then the little part on the beach where her and Adian have their little moment and he says that he's going to marry her. Like that was really sweet and cute. But then it just got like ruined because he got territorial again. And I was like, I just, I don't care. But now we move on to the two characters that I was reading this entire book for, Dorian and Manon. So ever since Air of Fire, Dorian has been one of my favorite characters in the series. I've loved him. I thought that he was like just so pure and good and one of the only ones left who I still had hope for. So I was really excited to read about him in this one. But after finishing it, just, 
Wow. <laughs> Honestly, props to Sarah J Mass for being able to make me hate all of the characters that I once loved and love all of the characters that I once hated. I don't really know if that's a good thing or not, but it consistently happens in each book. So for the most part, I was okay with Dorian in this book. He really didn't do that much. But when we got to his relationship with Manon, I just... Oh god, it was too much for me. Honestly, I was actually kind of rooting for that relationship at the end of Queen of Shadows. But once we like actually got to what happened between the two of them in here, it was not what I was expecting and it was just, mm, I didn't like it. The thing I always liked about Dorian was that he wasn't one of those territorial fey males like the other characters in the book. I mean, he was to some degree, but it was lessened, so I've like completely lowered my standards for this case. But in the scene where he and Manon have sex, I think it's like afterwards or something, he like promises something to her, but then in the narration it says it was a purely male promise. And I read that and I was like, what? Are promises gendered? Is that like a thing now? Like can your promise be purely female or purely male? Like what does that mean? What does a purely male promise mean? Like what difference does a male or female promise make? Like what was she trying to get out with that line? Like I don't understand. It was just things like that I guess and it was his relationship with Manon. There were little lines like that throughout that they had for Dorian's narration. There was also the moment where he basically said that Manon was like woman enough because she had a vagina and that was like good enough for him and I was like okay uh, um, I've had enough of this. So yeah Dorian was just like a big disappointment in this one for me. I didn't enjoy almost any of the moments that he had. Um, yeah, no, it was not a fun time for me. And then we move on to Manon, who is my favorite character in the entire series. But honestly, probably by the last book, I'll end up hating her too, because the only consistent thing in this series is that I end up hating every single character. So there were a total of two moments in this entire book that I genuinely, genuinely enjoyed, and both of them had to do with Manon and the Thirteen. The first one was early on, where Astrin was sentenced to death and Manon had to kill her, and then she ends up bringing her sword down onto her grandmother that moment got to me when the 13 like saluted to her as their queen I had chills I started tearing up I was in my school library and I couldn't like full-on cry without people staring at me but I loved that moment it was amazing and the other moment that I really enjoyed was at the very end when the 13 come in and they basically like save the day and they're like we're supporting you Manon and Abraxos comes back with them and I was just like it warmed my heart they're genuinely the only ones I care about they're all kind of evil and they don't really have a side and I I love them but overall with Manon's character and I was kind of worried about this from the end of Queen of Shadows and why I didn't fully support her relationship with Dorian I was afraid that she'd be reduced to a love interest and for the most part, I felt like that's kind of where her character was headed in this one. There were large gaps, like 170 page gaps of this book with no Manon in them because she was like passed out and like almost killed by her grandmother. So we didn't get that much of her in this book and all the moments that we did get with her were pretty much just with her and Dorian and I just... I wasn't a fan of it. I feel like Manon is such a complex and interesting character that you could take in so many different directions, you could expand her in so many different ways, and just to take her and make most of the scenes she has in this book alone with Dorian, I just wasn't happy about that. Like don't get me wrong, I don't think Manon shouldn't have a love interest. Like I don't think that she should and I don't think that she shouldn't, I don't think it's wrong for her to have one, but also I feel like that was the only development she got in here and it just mm, it didn't sit well with me. And finally, moving on to the last character who you may be thinking, did she forget to mention him? Um, no, I did not. Unlike this book, I completely and utterly remember Kale Westfall and how important he was to this series. So yeah, let's talk about Kale and the fact that he wasn't in this book at all and only mentioned in passing by Dorian like every 100 pages when he said that he wished that Kale were here. I will never understand why she decided to paralyze Kale in the last book and then not write about him in the next one. If you really didn't want him in your book that much, he could have just killed him off in the last book. I will also forever find it problematic that she disabled one of her characters and then didn't write him into the next book, so basically just like erased him. I feel like you can clearly see how that might be interpreted in a problematic way. Why would you disable a character and then stop writing about them? She could have killed him and stopped writing about him if she didn't want him in the book that much, but she disabled him and proceeded to erase him from the book. Honestly, I'm not really upset because I still loved Kale so much. Honestly, after Queen of Shadows, 
he was pissing me off. I'm just upset about the way that his character is being treated because flat out I just think it's wrong. But that pretty much covers it for all of my thoughts on Empire of Storms. Overall I gave this book a 2 out of 5 stars. Honestly going back through my notes and going through this review, part of me kind of wants to lower that rating. I don't know if I really will, but like that's what we're going with for now. Clearly I had a lot of issues with this one. I don't really like where the series is headed. As for if I'm going to read the next book, honestly I haven't made up my mind yet. I think I probably will just because it's the last book, but I don't know if I'm gonna buy it. I think I might just check it out from the library or something because so far this series is just headed downhill for me and I don't think it can really redeem itself for me at this point. So let me know in the comments down below all of your thoughts on Empire of Storms. I feel like most people's opinions on this book are kind of half and half. Some people really really loved it and other people really didn't like it. So please keep it civil when discussing the book, but definitely let me know all of your thoughts on Empire of Storms because I'd love to discuss it with you. If you want to talk to me about Empire of Storms anywhere else, you can find me on any of my social media. Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Snapchat, any of those. The links are all in the description box if you would like to go follow me there. But that is it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in my next video. Bye!